Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to have all of the scholars participating in the Age of Reagan conference here, and then other friends and supporters of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute uh, to participate in this very exciting uh, last element of our program. I want to acknowledge Congressman Gallagher here and his wife Janice. Welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Now that I've introduced the congressman, I can introduce myself. I'm Roger Zakheim, and I'm the director of the Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. And for those of you who don't know, the Reagan Foundation Institute is bicoastal, and that makes us unique amongst presidential foundations. And the Institute has been in D.C. for a while, but officially, we cut our ribbon on our brand new facility last year. We're across from Lafayette Park from the White House, and I really hope each and every one of you will have an opportunity to visit us when you're on the other side of the country. <laughs> there we go, we'll get an applause for that. Now the Reagan Institute is, really provides a forum for debating the policies that affect us today. We are not a memorial or a monument. It is a living and breathing, life-sustaining venture. We do more than simply preserve the memory of President Reagan. We help perpetuate institutions, the ideas and principles and values that he strengthened. Now, one cannot perpetuate those ideas and principles and values without understanding them. And that, at its core, is why we're investing in all of you, all of the scholars assembled here for this conference. President Reagan, as Anthony reminded us yesterday, wanted his library to be a place where, quote, scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Each is necessary, each is important, and they are related. Your scholarship allows us to understand how we got here, which allows us to navigate how best to move forward. It's why I'm so grateful to our Director of Scholarly Initiatives, Dr. Anthony Eames, the mastermind of this conference. Now, if Anthony hadn't published two books this year, I really would have questioned his scholarly credentials because he did such a darn good job organizing this program. Where is Anthony? Where is he? Yeah, there he is. Congratulations. You did a great job. Now, Anthony arrived at the Reagan Institute via our Visiting Fellows Program, which Professor Henry now, where is Henry? Oh, he's over there right in the middle. Henry, say hi. There we go. Henry, I'm talking to you. Say hi. I was calling you out. He helped us build. It's a fantastic program. We support young scholars writing on Reagan, convert their manuscripts into a book. Now, I hope you've all had a chance to meet and interact with Luke Griffith, a former visiting fellow. Where's Luke? There he is in the back. of All of you guys in the back. There we go. And Will Chu and Nathan Gibson, our current fellows. Where's, where's Luke? And where's, there we go. Over there. Hi, Nathan. And where's Will? Over there. Well done. Look out for their works coming soon to a bookshelf near you. Now, I also want to thank the amazing Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute team who put this whole program together. Many of them are in the back. Thank you guys, well done. And last in my list of very important thank yous is to our president and CEO, Dave Trulio. Where's Dave, there he is. Dave has been a champion of this event and more broadly and importantly, a real champion of our scholarly initiatives program. Thank you, Dave. Now, we're also proud to partner with scholars and foundation institutions and we have special thanks for our partners for this event, Pepperdine School of Public Policy, the Woodrow Wilson Center, and the Clemens Center at the University of Texas, Austin. Thank you for helping us bring the Age of Reagan Conference to life. Thank you. Now, rest assured, this conference is not a one-off. We will continue to drive and promote scholarship of the 40th president during his time in office and his era more broadly, and we will need your help in that endeavor. Again, our goal is to learn from history to shape the future. But we don't only learn from the archives, we also learn from leaders who were there, 
those who were present at the revolution. Now the three men who will join us on stage in just a moment all had storied careers in politics, but their careers were just the beginning when Reagan stepped into office. First, former Senator Phil Graham of Texas was a Democrat before he became a member, member of the Republican Party. And he was a Democratic member of Congress when President Reagan was elected. There we go. But like our 40th president, the Dem Democratic Party left him. So in 1983, he resigned from his own seat, switched parties, and won a special election to fill his own vacancy. A great story. And by 1985, he was serving in the Senate, where he co-sponsored the 1985 Balanced Budget Act and went on to chair the Banking Committee. Next panelist is former Congressman David Dreyer, who came into office along with President Reagan in 1981. He went on to serve for 32 years, representing California in the House and eventually chairing the House Rules Committee, most relevant to my professional life, ruling a bill I worked very hard on in order every year I was a staffer in the House Armed Services Committee, for which I'm very grateful. He was also, what one more? He's also a former chairman of the uh, Tribune Foundation, and he is currently the chair of the Falling Journalist Memorial, where he's working on a memorial in Washington, D.C., and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in a bit. Last, we have former Congressman Hal Dobb, who also began his career in the House of Representatives in 1981, representing Nebraska's 2nd District. He left office the same year President Reagan did. He went on to serve as mayor of Omaha and chair the Social Security Advisory Board. So, please join me in welcoming these three distinguished leaders of the Reagan Revolution, and to moderate the conversation, Dr. John Hillen, accomplished in his own right, former Assistant Secretary of State, scholar, statesman, and a member of our National Leadership Council. Gentlemen, please take the stage. Appreciate it. Okay, Hal, David's oh, John. stuck in the middle with you guys. Hal, okay. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? okay no, you can. Thanks. So, um, we got these three titans of public service, and I want to dig into their service, especially during the Reagan era. But, but our theme is leadership, and we're here in the Presidential Leadership Center at, at the library, and I'm a professor of leadership and ethics, so um, I, I, I want that to be something we really probe on, and we're going to try to leave some time, and, and especially um, our three discussants here, we're particularly interested in engaging with the audience. So we're going to try to leave some time for questions from the audience, especially the scholars. You, know, you can bounce some of the ideas you've been wrestling with off of you know, people who were who are there and, and the experiences they have. But I do want to circle around this theme of leadership and getting things done. So let me ask the three of you guys first. You, you all came in at about the same time. Uh, Phil, you had already been elected in 78, as a Democrat, as Rogers described. And then David and Hal, you both came in with Reagan in 1980, though. You'd but we both, we both ran in 78. Ran. Yeah, so we all three ran in 78. So back to back, yeah. So started out, for in, losers started out in 78, though, all of us did. That's yeah. right, that's right. Y'all did 78. Right. So, so that, that's what I want to get to. I don't want to talk about the first term yet and the accomplishments of the first term. Give us a sense of the atmospherics the night before the election in 1980, right? What were oh you expecting? God. What did you expect? The, and, and, and not just for your sake, what did you think you were getting into? What was going to be the leadership environment? You know, if it all worked out, were you going to be able to get stuff done, right? We all know the story of, of the malaise and, and the Carter years, the promise of Reagan, who himself had worked very hard to be the Republican nominee over a long time, right? What did you think you were getting into and in the political atmospherics leading up to that night before we get into the practicalities of getting things done with the new administration during the first term? Well, in my case, I think maybe David as well, we ran in 78, so we had this taste of what could be accomplished and had a commitment to sort of persist and to try again back to back a second time. Phil, you tasted that in a variety of different <laughs> roles in that 78 to 80 time frame. 
But I think we thought that the Senate would go Republican and we were excited about the potential for the House going Republican. And it felt that we would have the opportunity for a unified government as opposed to divided government. And that was really, from my point of view, I, I've proven that I'm not good at the political stuff, I'm pretty good at the policy stuff. And that interested me, an opportunity to really make a difference in changing course yeah, for this country. And David, you were, you were running as, an, I think, an 11-year-old at the time. <laughs> uh, one, one, we all one, accused him of that, one, yeah. One yeah. of the youngest members of Congress ever elected. But what, what, what was the thinking on your second, your second campaign? Well, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. First, let me just say that um, it's always emotional for me to be here because uh, when I graduated from uh, Claremont McKenna College, I used to spend... Uh, I, my then girlfriend's mother was very close to Nancy Reagan, and I used to spend Christmases from 1975 to the last Christmas we had together was at Charles and Mary Jane Wick's house, uh, which was right after the 1980 election. We had both been elected, and I remember very, very vividly being there um, with, with the Reagans. Um, and uh, I've got a story that I'm going to tell in a little while about that. But as you talk about that night, I mean, I felt like um, Robert Redford um, did at the end of the movie. You all are too young to know that he made a, There was a movie that he was in called The Candidate. And at the end of this movie, Redford had won the election. He took out an incumbent, which is exactly what I did. I had an incumbent Democrat who was elected in the Watergate year. And I was 27 years old at that time. I had almost won in the 78 uh, when I was 26. and and. I just thought, I was just overwhelmed. In fact, when I think back on my life, it was really one of the scariest moments because unlike these guys who had, had uh, you know, lives and people with whom they'd worked, I, mean, I was basically a punk kid. One of the points I make, John, is, is that um, I was absolutely convinced when I was 25 years of age that I was very qualified to serve as a member of Congress. But since that time, I've never met a 25-year-old who I think is qualified to serve <laughs> in the Congress of the United States. So, uh, you know, I was very confident, confident going in. But we had what was called a working majority. Thanks to this guy, it was a working majority. So, and remember, we had this gain of 33 seats in the House of Representatives. So we took the Senate. And so, in many ways, we felt like we had almost one control. And we were described then as a working majority, right, even though we were in the minority. There were actually 60 new Republican yep. House faces with a net yep, yep. gain 33, of 30, 33. Yeah, 33 but, net uh, gain. But there were 60 brand new yep. House Republicans elected right. in right. that 80 election. Yep. And, and, and Phil, on your side, you're going to that election as a successful serving Democratic congressman. What was the thinking, and what was the thinking of the more conservative-leaning Democrats like, well, like you at the time? I had come to Congress two years earlier, and David Stockman and I had done a budget that we called a bipartisan budget. And we had had 31 Democrats vote for that budget. And so it was obvious that the election could potentially put us in the majority. And I had had the, an incumbent who was the most decorated soldier of World War II to serve in Congress that I'd replaced, and his son had run against me in the Democrat primary, and I'd won, so I knew I was going back. But uh, obviously, I was focused on the presidential election. We'd been in session late, and so when I was coming home, everybody knew how conservative I was, and so when I landed at the Dallas, in the Dallas airport on my way to College Station, there were 11 TV cameras, and this lady stuck a mic in my face and said, how do you recommend that people vote <laughs> in the presidential election? And so uh, I simply said, well, I'm not going to tell people how to vote, but if you love America, you'll know what to do. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the Democrats went ballistic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so, what's wrong with that? And, the, and the point being that if you loved America, it was clear after nine years of 9.2% inflation with the Russians in Afghanistan, with our uh, embassy staff held hostage, with stagnation everywhere, people knew that America was ready for change. Yep. And uh, I think the people who were elected, two of them sitting right, right here, 
we're ready to bring that change. Okay. So I'll tell you a story. Yeah. I'll tell you a story. So, inaugural, Reagan's coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. We're all enjoying the 80 result. Parties all night long. Everybody's up all night long. But you'll remember that he had the 60 new Republican House faces. I was still at a party, so I don't really yeah, remember. Yeah, you came. We were all at breakfast at 7 in the morning the yep. next morning yep. after the inaugural. And we're talking about public policy. And this was my, my best memory of Reagan because it was my first encounter with him. I was sitting right next to him at breakfast getting wow. autographs for my three kids. Wow. <laughs> really amazing. And you remember he stood at a podium and he, used, he always wrote his notes on these little index cards. He pulled three or four of them out of his pocket. And he set them on the little podium and he stood up to talk to us. He says, you know, I've never been a lawmaker or a legislator, but I was governor, as you know, of California, and I had to learn to work with people like you. <laughs> and he said, so I'll tell you how I think we'll get along and get some things done. And he said, and this is in a couple, two or three books that have been written about him, very quick story. He said, I'll stand for my principles and fight for them, and I want you to stand for your principles and fight for them too. And then there was this little cock of the head to the right, remember it? And then he smiled. And he used his little index finger and he pointed and he circled around his feet and he said, once in a while you'll see the concrete cracking around my feet. And by that I mean, we'll fight for our principles, but there'll be times when we have to compromise. Mm. Well, I'll have to give a little bit and you'll have to give a little bit. And he said, all I expect from all of us is when we do compromise, we fall forward together. And that moment, that minute, was the public policy impression I had and saw confirmed for eight years that that's the way President Reagan looked at yeah. getting things done. And you also saw his pragmatism. Very, very, see, it, very, it, very kind of pluralism, right? Yeah, amazing that uh, yeah. Uh, and very instructive. And in, uh, the story that I like to tell right. about Ronald Reagan. Well, well, let's talk about that. Let's go forward. So the administration comes into town. They take care of it. They have a working majority, the state of crap, right? And, you know, Phil, you, you're going to be instrumental in helping push through the economic uh, agenda that, that, for some scholars, have said really represents the great achievements, Reagan's legislative achievements, you know, the, the I don't want to say the honeymoon period, but that kind of, you know, first term economic and, and budget achievements. But it's not just two parties. There's uh, factions within parties. I mean, Reagan didn't look at the Republican Senate leaders and see a bunch of Reaganites, right? When he, when he looked there, these were, these were traditional Republicans with different ideas that had not been part of the revolution per se. The house is split up. We have all this entomology. We have boll weevils. We have gypsy moths and other varieties of political insects. And, and the, the factions go right on back up through to the White House, right? Even his advice, close advice in the White House had different ideas about legislative strategy, prioritization things. Darman, of course, is in his own you know, you know, world and so on. So um, give us a sense of one of the great tasks of leaders, assembling coalitions, making compromises, pulling people along, generating followership, getting things done. Give us a sense, maybe Phil, we'll start with you. What did that look like when you're on the, the receiving end of the legislative strategy from the White House and we're asking you to, to lay down some political capital on the Hill to get their agenda through in this kind of fractious environment? Well, uh, it started with conservative Democrats. We, we had had a, a bipartisan budget. We had had a good vote on it, but it didn't have a cut dog's chance of becoming law. And so it's one thing to cut vote for something when you don't know that it's gonna have any effect and doing it when you're shooting with real bullets. So David Stockman, that I had become very close friends with, had become OMB director. And so our budget became the Reagan budget. Uh, there were refinements, mostly compromises, uh, but it was the budget. And so the first thing we had to do was to get the Democrats that had voted for it two years earlier to vote for it again. Was the White House an expectation that you'd carry that water for him on that? Well, we had a, the final meeting. The budget was put together. It was clear I was going to author, uh, that I was going to be the, the principal author of it. Tip O'Neill wouldn't let me offer it, so I couldn't. 
I couldn't offer it, but he let let offer it, and then let it yielded to me. But so the four, we had the final meeting of Democrats, and so it just turned into a debate and all kinds of excuses and and wet pants. And so <laughs> I said, well, I can see if William Barrett Travis at the Alamo had had a debate instead of drawing the line in the sand, <laughs> there never would have been a battle there. I'd still be alive. And Jack Hightower, yeah. you might remember sure, him, was a eunuch. Sure. And uh, <laughs> he said, well, Phil, you need to remember what happened to all those guys uh, that crossed the line at the Alamo. They all died. In yeah. one of the most lucid moments of my life, I said, yeah, but so did the guys who didn't cross the yep. line, only nobody remembers their names. Right, yeah, yeah, right, they were. Right, right, right. And so. Die on your uh, feet or die on your knees. Everybody it's your died. choice. So at that point, uh, uh, another congressman got up and said, Graham's going to offer this amendment, and I'm going to vote for it if I'm the only son of a bitch in this room. And at that point, it sort of crystallized. And the 10 or so guys who worked with the program to begin with left. And it came down, we needed 26 votes. And in the end, we had 26 votes now. We had to buy a few of them on various changes. But uh, that was the first step. And then obviously you had problems with Republicans. We eliminated three Social Security benefits in this budget. Yep. In one day, yeah. So it wasn't it it wasn't a walk in the park. It sure. was a tough vote, but Social Security was bankrupt. You have to say that it was the linchpin. It was the start. It wasn't the end, but it was the start. A coalition, bipartisan, yeah. and I would say, thank God, you were still a Democrat then, because it probably wouldn't have gotten done if you hadn't brought that bull weevil, the son of Montgomery, that group along yeah. um, to understand the need for the change in direction. And, and it was a very somebody, important thing that you did. Well, you should, they were four. Shouldn't he be complimented the, for the work that he did and then the courage he had to follow through by changing parties when they kicked him off the committee? Yeah, here, 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 here. Yeah. Hey, well, Dave, let, me, let me just Dave, say, jump let, in here, let, yeah. Let, let me just say first, uh, we're here to deify Ronald Reagan, not Phil Graham, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, so well, they, they both so, deserve it. But let, let me say this as we, as we talk about the way this was uh, put, sorry, Wendy, but um, anyway, so the, the, way, the way this was put together, the other thing that we need to remember was in getting the votes for Graham Latta in June of 1981, and then in August of 1981 for Conable Hans, which was the tax package, right. um, one of the things that got Democrats to vote for it. One I will specifically name from your state was March 30th, 1981, when Ronald Reagan was nearly killed. Yeah. And that assassination attempt mm. on Ronald Reagan led many Democrats with whom I interacted. It was the chairman of the Agriculture Committee, Kiki La Garza, who said to me, I, I was talking to him probably on one of our Mexico trips, Phil and, and Wendy, and Kika said, I don't believe in any of this shit. I mean, that's, you know, he just says, I don't believe in any of this. But my constituents are calling in such overwhelming numbers since President Reagan was shot that I have no choice. And he was one of the votes. Kika was. Yep. yep. And Kika voted for that. But he made it very clear that he had absolutely no sense whatsoever, no commitment to it at all. But it was just raw politics for him. Well, that was true for some, wasn't true for others. Yeah. Um, it, was a, it was a tough vote, and of course, you had a few people in both parties that were for it, but it wasn't perfect, and so they couldn't vote for right. it. What, what, what was uh, the Ron leadership? Ron Paul being standard yeah. exam. I got yeah. down on my knees, and I said, Ron, this thing's going to come down to one or two votes. You understand the future of the country? is on the line yeah. here. Can you please vote with us? And so he said to me, well, you know, I said I'd never vote for a budget that had a deficit. And I said, yeah. well, you can't write a budget in 1981 that can get 50 votes yep. that doesn't have a deficit. 
You know, you got to begin somewhere to make a change. But he voted with us through final passage, until final passage, but he voted against final passage. And we got to a point during the votes where we were down to one vote. That close. And Sam Hall from uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, East Texas, Texas yeah. was the last vote, and it was Judge. a tie vote. And well, we were 30 minutes over the voting limit, Waiting and Tip O'Neill <laughs> came down to, to Sam Hall and put his arm around Sam and said, this bill is a disgrace and an embarrassment to the House, because y'all may not remember, but Latta, Dell Latta from Ohio, made some changes in the bill at the last minute and didn't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and yep, so I I, we spent the whole day figuring out what he had done and how to explain it. And um, so it was a mess and they had had the, this lady who had worked on it with them and left her telephone, telephone number. Telephone number, telephone number and, on there, yep. Mm -hmm. I, I remember well, Bill Adams, I remember. So anyway, I remember so that number. the speaker <laughs> said, you know, this is about the house and about the embarrassment to the house. And so I stepped back, I didn't say a word until Tip went back up to the table. And so I just stepped forward and said, Sam, this bill is, there are a lot of things have, have become a problem here, but this is about America and we're going to conference, we can fix this thing. And God bless him, he was a John Wayne kind of figure. He took out his card and everybody in the house is watching, stuck it in and pressed I. And when he pressed I, about 10 other people yep. changed their vote, mm. and the Reagan Shifted program right became yeah. law, yeah. and the Berlin Wall came down, and the world was changed. Yeah. <laughs> and Sam Hall became a federal judge. And Sam, by, Hall, Sam Hall became a judge. I, I yeah. recommended Sam Hall for federal to the bench, and he was appointed by so Ronald Reagan. Reagan. By Ronald Reagan, he became, became a judge. A judge. Yeah. Yeah. Dur during all this drama, did you? What was support from the White House? What did it look like? How did you feel? And how did you? What, what was Reagan's role? Was he there if you needed him? You know, he'd make a couple of calls. He was famous for calling even you know, members' mothers and stuff and, and well, you know, t talking to no, them. Or, or did you important. not need him? You, you're like, we've got this. You just had the assassination attempt. We'll, we'll get it through. What was the, what was the no, White well, House look, role? Reagan, there was never, any, I didn't need anybody to support me. You know, to me, this was my program. This is the one thing about Reagan. Reagan never called it his program. Yeah, yeah. he called it our yeah. program. Right, yeah. um, where Reagan was supportive of me is when we lost 30 seats in the election, and the Democrats were back in control, and so the first thing they did was throw me off the budget committee, and so. Then you know, you right. act like you were never a part of me. You keep saying we and them. I mean, you were a Democrat then. Yeah, so you I understand. Were, yeah, yeah, but yeah. this was about, again, <laughs> this was about America. I remember listening to the inaugural address thinking to myself, I never thought I'd live to have somebody president of the United States who thinks like I do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, our view was so much in the minority. Yep. Uh, but in any case, uh, Reagan was very, very supportive, and a qu very quick story. I decided the right thing to do was to resign from Congress and go home and run again as a Republican, and because there would be people that would feel like I'd flown false colors, and, and um, so uh, uh, Lee Atwater begged the president to call me and try to talk me out of it. I had sent a note saying I was going to do it. And uh, so the president called me and said, Lee's having a heart attack. And what, you know, tell me what's happening. And I said did, to him, yeah. well, you know, look, I was elected as a Democrat and everybody knew how conservative I was, but I was elected as a Democrat. If I just change parties, um, the, uh, it'll look, there'll be people who will feel betrayed. So anyway, um, so Reagan said, well, you know, it sounds to me like the right thing to do. He said, uh, 
uh, you know, people have a way of judging people's motives. Now, I was in a district where no Republican ever got more than 35 percent of the vote. And so anyway, I didn't know until I'd resigned, ran against nine opponents and been reelected that Lee Atwood had gone back into the office, said to Reagan, Graham's going to lose this race. This is going to be the beginning of the end of the Reagan presidency. And Ronald Reagan said to him, Lee, the whole world does not revolve around me or the Reagan presidency. This is the right thing for Graham to do, and I'm not going to call him back. Yeah. Love it. Good. That's, now, that's how a, many people that's in government today yeah. would take the view like that. Yeah. that my presidency is not the center of the world? Yeah. That's a great <laughs> leadership <laughs> anecdote. Well, 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 Phil, you brought something up. So 82 midterms are a disaster for the Republicans, losing 26 seats or so in the House. Still keep 26, the, yeah. the Senate. Yeah. Um, so now, now it's a different leadership challenge for a president trying to work with Congress. And then, of course, I'll even fast forward a little bit. 84, great personal victory on the presidential right. level for the president, but it doesn't do much to change the complexion of Congress. Mm -hmm. So how did you guys sense the different approach from the administration and some new personalities? You know, Jim Baker, Don Regan switch out. Yep. And Regan, my guess is Regan's pretty contemptuous of Congress. Baker understood how to, how to get things done, perhaps. How, how did you see, how did you feel, what was different after that first term and the economic and budget victories of the White House trying to get stuff done working with that Congress. How did, how, how did, how did, how did it fall down on you? What did you see? Well, through, the, through that 81, 82, 83 time frame, uh, there was quite a change in the economy. No. And there's a, a, a set of complex reasons why that could be explained and take a long time to do it. But if you remember, farm, farmers were being foreclosed all yeah. across the country. Interest rates were 21.5% if you could find it at a bank. Unemployment was very digit, high, yeah. double digit for a long time. And so you had uh, this president who was very popular, personable, and uh, not full of himself. And it showed. Mm. And I think that made a big difference with Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate members in both parties, that he felt like we were together in the game, not just him in mm. the game, and for us to have to uh, uh, sort of kiss his ring. And, and I think that went a long way. He was also willing to be public about his views, whether it was regulatory relief or the Federal Reserve or interest rates or unemployment. And he made some really, I think, important public policy decisions that the executive branch could make administratively that began to turn the tide on the, the things that were hurting people and were causing them to feel bad about the way things were. Mm -hmm. So the shift occurred over three years. It took three years. I don't think yep. it was an instant. It didn't happen in 81 or 82. In 83 and 84, it started to turn a little bit. And I think that the uh, differences in the House and the Senate numbers didn't make any difference. I right. think it was well, the uh, president. He, it, was, he was persistent in working, working the phone. And yeah. Hal is absolutely yeah, right no, when I he think. says he was persistent in the way he did this. So knowing that I was going to be here, um, I called a couple of people in Washington because I, I left 10 years ago and I've not set foot in the Capitol since I left. And um, actually Elton and I left at the, at the same time. And I, I will say that um, I think that what, I, what these people, when I, when I said to them, the first thing they mentioned was Reagan's humor. And if you think about most of it today, there really is virtually no humor in politics today. Mm. And so the, the, the story that I'm going to tell is, to, to your point, John, in August of 1982, I remember being out here, and there was a small garden party held at a guy's, he was the head of Teledyne, a guy called Henry Singleton, who was a neighbor of Cheryl Teague's up here in Bel Air. And I went to this, I went to this uh, lunch. And at that point, and Hal said it perfectly, uh, we had interest rates that were approaching 20%. I remember when we got there, I, my, my dad was in the real estate business and everybody was renting and my dad said, David, we don't, we don't pay rent, we collect it. So my father gave me the down payment and I bought a place. I had a 16.5% mortgage on my little place on Capitol Hill. And the unemployment rate was well into double digits and uh, you know, so, so we had interest, and inflation was still very, very high. So we were at this party at the Singletons, and there may be 20 people gathered, 
and everyone is wringing their hands. And Nancy and Ronald Reagan arrived, and everybody is there, and we sit down, and President Reagan stands up after this luncheon. So, you know, somebody was asking me the other day how I was feeling, and he said, uh, I've never been better. Well, everybody looked around and wondered what was wrong with President Reagan. <laughs> Unemployment, interest rates, inflation, exactly where it was. And he said, the reason I say that, I'm reminded of this huge caravan of farm animals being driven through the countryside. You all know the story. But anyway, the huge uh, farm animals being driven through a countryside, there's this terrible accident, animals strewn all over the highway. And the sheriff comes up, gets out of his car, and he sees this horse lying on the side of the road. And he has two broken legs frothing at the mouth, so he takes his gun out and puts the horse out of his misery. Then he sees a dog, just about the same thing, shaking like there's no tomorrow. And so he takes his gun out, puts him out of his misery. Then he sees the driver of one of the vehicles, two broken legs, blood running down his face. And he said, and how are you feeling? I've never been better. <laughs> and so, so, so President, Reagan, President Reagan was able to, I mean, at, and that was, I've heard that story many times since, and, and uh, I tell it almost as well as President Reagan did. I've told it so many times now, but it's, a, it's a, a very, very instructive of how he did that. The other one is, so Phil's talking about Tip O'Neill, and Tip O'Neill uh, retired in 1986, and Joe Kennedy took his spot uh, in Massachusetts, from Massachusetts, and there was a, a there was a lunch, a dinner, that actually President Reagan had for Tip O'Neill. Um, so if you can imagine a Republican president today having a dinner for a Democrat or vice versa today. So let me share the toast that President Reagan offered as Tip O'Neill retired. And by the way, I, you know, I was talking to Professor Michael Fortner, who's here uh, yesterday, about, about the fact that uh, this relationship between Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan was greatly exaggerated, like they were like mm. best pals. Mm. I mean, it was pretty tense. Tip O'Neill resisted everything yeah. he tried to yeah, do. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. So okay. they were not, at 6 o'clock, uh, you could right. count the number of times, a half dozen times with cameras there when they would have a beer together. But Reagan had this retirement dinner for Tip, and Reagan got up. And he looked to Tip, and he said, Tip, if I had a ticket to heaven and you didn't get one too, I'd give my ticket back and go straight to hell with you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was how Ronald Reagan toasted the Speaker of the House uh, as he was going. So this is, this is why it seems to me that we, we really do need to have more humor uh, injected into this process now. And, you know, I mean, the, the funniest member of Congress, of course, was, you know, Mo Udall, oh, who, you know. you know, when he was campaigning for president, he walked into a barbershop in Nashua, New Hampshire, says, hi, I'm Mo Udall, I'm running for president. Barbara looked at him and said, yeah, we were just laughing about that this morning. And so, you know, the, he, he really, he wrote a book called Too Funny to Be President. And I think that when I talked to these two, one of them was Landon Parvin, who was a longtime speechwriter. And Landon, um, talked about humor, which he's very famous for. Landon, frankly, I will tell you all a secret. Uh, you, know, you know Reagan's great line, um, it actually is from Landon Parvin. You know, they say hard work never killed anybody, but I figured, why take the chance? <laughs> and that line actually came from Landon Parvin and a number of other really, really great ones that Reagan used. And so he talked about this humor thing, which is just so, so important. And Reagan used that in a big were, way. Were you look, guys look able what, to look use Look what he that. got done, though. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. With Tip O'Neill. Yep. His relationship got Social Security, first only legislation that we've had since then to do years. something about it. Yep. For, for, Made Social yep. Security and, 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 and then look, years. look, yep. look and, and then the, I was on Ways and Means, look at tax reform in 86, he and O'Neill and uh, Rosinkowski made the deal. So he didn't maybe have uh, whiskey or beer very often, as they was reported, done, yeah. you? but they got along, they yeah. got along. He figured out how to get along. Were you guys able to use that? I mean, are you conscious of Reagan's growing popularity, especially manifested in the 84 election, right? Because his actual, the structural challenges of Congress are getting worse, but he's getting more personally popular. And, and in talking with some of his you know, former congressional staff, they would do things like um, he'd be trying to convince a Democratic uh, congressman from South Carolina to do this guy says, I'm not going to vote with you, Mr. President. In the meantime, because Reagan was so personally popular in that guy's district, he'd have 60 or 70 business leaders who would have contributed to that Democratic congressman, start lobbying the congressman, 
and saying, don't disappoint President Reagan. They'd be, so they'd be getting, so members who were against him were getting constituent calls that his team had been pressuring to set up. So he was learning as a leader to leverage the assets he had. He had a structural problem with Congress, but he had this in, tremendous asset, perhaps fleeting for politicians after 1984, huge personal popularity. Do you guys feel that? How did it manifest itself in your lives? Were you, were you able to use that to get things done on the Hill? I felt it in the exact same way, and I will tell you, I mean, it was particularly, particularly difficult. I mean, I told you about I had this history of having spent Christmases with them from 1975 until after we were elected. And I had the ignominious distinction of being the first person to defeat two incumbents in back-to-back -back elections. I defeated a Democrat, and then redistricting forced me to run against a senior Republican. Wayne Grisham was the guy's name, and I, had to, and I, and I defeated him, and defeated him on the issue of taxes. And uh, he'd said that he basically was generally, and you know, he would consider a tax increase. And I said, I basically did a George Bush, read my lips, no new taxes. And so that was in June of 1982. We had something known as the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act. Oh, and it was a $98.5 billion tax increase, and it was supposed to be three for one, $3 in spending cuts for every $1 in taxes increased. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had just seven weeks before won this primary election, and I had said, there is no way I can vote for this. This is what year now? Te 1982. Oh, okay. This is, 19 this is August of 82. It was TEFRA. You remember TEFRA. Yeah. I renamed it TIFI. I called it the Tax Inequity and Fiscal Irresponsibility Act of 1982. <laughs> so it was a $98.5 billion tax increase. It was kind of the thing that Bush in 1990 went through with the whole read my lips and his budget deal. But so mm. I, I was uh, sitting, uh, so the president called me. I said, I said, I just can't vote for this. I said, I just had this campaign. I said, I'm not going to vote for taxes. And the president was for this. So I ended up uh, going down and I was sitting in the Oval Office with the president. And I, I, I'm very embarrassed to this moment that I said what I did. Um, but I, you know, politicians are known for occasionally talking about youthful indiscretions. This was, a, I was 28, so I was, it was a youthful indiscretion then. So here I am still in my 20s and I'm sitting there and Jim Baker and Ed Meese and Mike Deaver, and I remember Lynn Nofziger was sitting there because I'd been an intern for him in 1972 when he was running the Nixon campaign out here. So they're sitting there and we're going through all this and the president says, well, David, you know, we you know, had all these great time, Christmases together, and he was one of the first people who encouraged me when I was like 23 or 24 to run. And he, and he said, you know, I really you know, hope you can vote for this. And um, then he said to me, to your point, John, about the skill he had created, he said, um, you know, I think this is kind of a question of, of loyalty, the president says Ooh, to me as we're hurt. sitting there. Oh, oh that hurt. Okay, so here's this youthful indiscretion, and I said, with all due respect, Mr. President, I'm afraid that you're being disloyal to the platform that sent both of us here to Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. Well, Lynn Nofziger nearly slid off the couch. <laughs> but to let you know what Reagan's response was, he then invited me to Camp David after I said that to him. And I did vote no, I did not vote for it because I had made this commitment just weeks before, especially as I was campaigning, but it's instructive of how he responded. Roger Porter, who some of you historians may know, two of my favorite Harvard Porters are Roger and Michael Porter. Michael Porter, I learned about trade from him and Roger Porter. Roger Porter said this group came into the Oval Office and they were being as nasty to, if possible to the president and the president just sat there and had absolutely no response. And these people left, and Roger said to him, Mr. President, I mean, these people were so horrible. They were so, they were dead wrong on everything they said, and they were just absolutely horrible, and you had no response. And President Reagan looked to Roger, and he said, Roger, he said, um, I can't control the way other people behave. I can only control the way I behave. And that was how mm. he responded to these vitriolic attacks that were unloaded on him. I had the same story. I got the call from the White House, the president wants to speak with you. And so I picked up the phone and he said, three of you young new Republican House members voted no on my request to raise the gas tax to get our country back to work, 1981, members of the amendment. Mm. And I did promise during my campaign I would never vote for a tax increase. 
until I was sitting on the couch in the Oval Office <laughs> with two other members of Congress listening to this very persuasive and very appealing. Right, but you we've were, got you to were, get the. You, you this were is about charged. the country, Phil. You said this is about the country. We've got to put people back to work, and that's concrete and steel, and that's labor, and that's jobs, and jobs in your district, and you have to change your vote. I did. Right, but you were being charmed. Like Lyndon Johnson oh, would, Lyndon yeah, Johnson would give people I, the treatment, right? I can't. Not, My first time on the couch, I not the last time, but the first time. Share this similar Reagan okay, story. Let's hear it. Two days before the final vote on the Reagan uh, reconciliation bill, which actually made the cuts yeah. and made it in order to offer the tax cuts, thirty Republicans got cold feet. And so the 30 Republicans, Dell Latta and I, were asked to come to the White House. Was this in 82? This was right before our vote on the, the, what was called Graham, Graham Ladder Latta 2. Oh, yeah, Graham Ladder 2, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so the president sent out to the lobby for them to bring me in, and he said, well, you know, they're demanding that there be a series of changes. And I want to know what you think. And so I said, well, <laughs> you need to realize that three years ago I was teaching college economics. I, I've never done anything remotely this important in my life. I don't know that you ought to be paying much attention to my advice. <laughs> and he said, well, I've never done anything this important either. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, I told him, I didn't know if, you, if we start compromising now, right on the vote, I don't know where it stops. So we went into the room. Ladder didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. And so the president started around the room. He said, you call a meeting. You know, tell me what it is. Uh, what what you need. So anyway, I don't know whether the first guy just had a good line and everybody copied it or whether <laughs> they had planned it, but the first guy said, Mr. President, I'm with you. You know, I support your program. I believe in everything you believe in, but my constituents, and then he explained his problem. He couldn't vote for those Social Security cuts <laughs> and a bunch of other things. So it went all the way around the room, got back to me, the president looked at me, I didn't say anything. So the president just looked at everybody, <laughs> what seemed five minutes, and then he said, you know, I, I, I've been confused. He said, I thought this was about our country, not about our constituency, and he got up and left. And, there were yep. very few dry eyes. Yeah, in the he used that line a lot. Yeah. And uh, There's, so anyway, two days ago when we vote, not one person in that room. They all flipped. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everybody voted. There's on. people did tell him though. There's a story of a, a congressman coming out a, a cloakroom call with the president, um, where he told, but he had he had his eyes were a little teary, eyes were a little welled up, and his colleague said, did you tell the president you were gonna flip? He said, no, I voted no. He said, but I'm so sad, because I felt like I was telling my grandfather I couldn't go to the ball game with him. <laughs> so, you know, that's the way he expressed it. So he's always trying to charm, always trying to, to work that. So, so let's, before we turn to the, some audience thoughts, give us your grade. Uh, there's a little bit of a mythology that the bully pulpit, the Reagan popularity, the Irish charm, all that, you know, enabled him to, he never had his Congress for the revolution, right? Well, you know, he said he wasn't yeah. the great communicator. He was just communicating great ideas. I yeah. mean, to Phil's point, this was about what he was doing. Yeah. We were doing the right thing. Yeah. I mean, Jim Wright described him, the late Jim Wright described him as kind of like this formidable opponent, you know, could charm the socks off anybody. But when I look at the track record, oh. I thought Jim Wright did as good, yeah. gave as good as he a, got, right? right. So, 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 so how should we grade Reagan as a leader with Congress? An A. Yeah. For me, okay. he was a policy wonk. He had ideas, but he never pushed it off onto you saying, I'm the president. Hmm. It was really interesting to watch. And if you look at those eight years, think back on the data, just the hard data of that eight years and the consistency of the staff he hired. He had some really terrific staff people. The White House team was really effective. There were some clunkers, but, but yeah, 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 really yeah. good uh, yeah. staff people. And they really communicated well with mm -hmm. us, even though we were in the minority. We heard from them regularly. We were kept up to date. There were no, no surprises. But it wasn't this imperial 
presidency. Right, right. For me, I mean, I was, of course, it was an A. I mean, I, you know, he's, you know, my hero. So that's done. But I will tell you, it continued. And I was just remembering that um, I was uh, getting ready to give a speech, and, uh, and Nancy Reagan called on the phone. And it was back before we had all of our devices. And I was just literally at some big event, getting ready to give a speech. I said, oh, well, tell her I'll call back. And I could hear her screaming, no, David Dreyer, you're going to talk to me right now. <laughs> and it was, she was lobbying for the vote that I ended up providing for embryonic stem cell research mm -hmm. because of Alzheimer's as the president was suffering. So my point is, is that the effort continued well beyond the presidency, is what I was saying. And remember the Brady Bill, too. I mean, that was another one where they were both engaged well beyond the presidency, uh, you know, doing the things they were doing. Right. You know, I, I guess I would say, first of all, there's nothing phony about Ronald Reagan. Um, he believed everything he said. I never saw any difference between the private Ronald Reagan and and the public Ronald Reagan. A couple of jokes that he wouldn't have told in public. I yeah, well, I don't, but he would, not even his jokes were dirty. He did, he could, well, I got, I'll tell you later. Almost, almost <laughs> never cussed. All right, this is I, said, uh, rated R I'm not saying he was a general. saint, but I'm saying he was who he yes. claimed to be. Authentic. And he was a great communicator, but he was communicating very great <laughs> ideas. Mm. And, um, uh, he had lots of tools that made him effective, but in the end, his program worked, not because of his charm, but because their programs were good programs, because the policies worked. Right. Uh, and he brought America back. There's no question about it. Without him, it wouldn't have happened. Let's, let's get a couple of thoughts from the audience. And if you could just um, briefly identify yourself and then throw out something, we'll fill it up here. We've got these three treasures of American public life at your disposal for another 25 minutes before the pub opens. And we don't want to repeat a debate I'd heard earlier between Senator Graham and one of our scholars on Jap Japanese industrial productivity gains or not gains and contributions. Yeah, but it was really, it was really, good, it was really good. It was really I was good. just lost after yeah, two right. sentences. He was, a, he yeah. was, a, he was yeah. phantom. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Willem Bowden, please. And do we, we have a microphone coming to you, Will. So uh, this is a serious question, and I'm going to ask it just because you brought up the Will debate. Willem Bowden, about, uh, University congratulations, of congratulations, congratulations on your award. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. And so, the recipient of our book award. Yeah, yeah that's why right. I say congratulations. Right. So, um, uh, but uh, I actually Speak right this is a Japanese. Mic, you're dealing with into the microphone. People. Okay, yeah, this is a Japan this is question. Saint so, said, but make love uh, to um, uh, tell us your view in Congress in the er there in the early 1980s when there's tremendous domestic protectionist sentiment. So many Americans worried about Japanese, you know, imports stealing our jobs. Because uh, I know that President Reagan was out of conviction more of a free trader, uh, both as a matter of uh, economic policy, but also as a way of binding our, our allies together. But also know that he did have to uh, be at least mindful of public sentiment really against him. So what was your view in, in Congress? Congress on uh, the Reagan trade policy and then maybe uh, what you might have been hear hearing from folks at home. How, in, how 1979, in, in 1979, when he announced his candidacy for president, most everybody thinks about all these other issues that we're talking about, but few people remember that in that announcement for president, he envisaged an accord of trade among the Americas. That was the dream that he put forward at that time. Um, so Donald Trump's people, I mean, I'm taking a breath before I say this, uh, tried to liken his dealing with Japanese automobiles to all the action that Donald Trump was taking on tariffs. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you go back and talk to Bill Brock, who was you know, working on that issue at that time, when it came to Japanese automobiles and the furor that existed over that, there was, in fact, a negotiated agreement that existed that restrained them. There was not an imposition of tariffs. And so there, uh, you know, and, and look at what has happened to that issue since then. Before we sat down, I told my, my pal Phil here that I remember one of the best speeches that he gave because Wendy and Phil and I would year after year 
go to the Mexico-U.S. Interparliamentary Conference. I mean, I, I went all the way up till uh, I uh, ended uh, my term. So I was there for basically a third of a century to almost every one of those meetings. Phil gave, at one of the meetings there, the most outstanding and passionate speech on free trade. And I learned it from my old management professor, Peter Drucker, and my family and all that, and, Ray, and Ronald Reagan, and that speech of Ronald Reagan's announcing it. But the, and, and, and Reagan was able to talk about the, he's, you know, he said, he said uh, you know, in all the arsenals of the world, no weapon is so powerful as the will and moral courage of free men and women, and free trade is part of that. So the expansion of freedom is something that, that he was very, very passionate about. So he dealt with the Japanese auto issue, but not with the imposition of tariffs because he was quoted as saying that he opposed that. Phil, yeah, tell, I, Phil, tell the story. Yeah. Tell the story I heard yeah. you tell earlier I, about the automakers all, going to Reagan. Reagan was the most committed free trader to ever be president of the United yep. States. There's no question about that. He came into office with some IOUs from the campaign, uh, but in every key aspect of his presidency, he was he basically took the principle that. Free trade is about free people. About free markets and free That who gives government the right to force me to pay twice the world price for sugar so that 88,000 people can steal from 360 million people, which is what's happening in America today. Tell the story and about so the And so I was there when the automaker presidents came to the White House. So they came in. And they said to the president, we came to bring a message that is critically important that you understand. There is a real question, they said, whether we can stay in the car business in America. And so Reagan said to him, well, my God, what are you doing here? <laughs> why, why aren't you in Detroit? Why aren't you dealing with this problem? <laughs> the basic point what to them was compete or die. Yeah. And, and we were big... making crappy cars. Yeah. They were overpriced. Yeah. The, we had had a monopoly since 1947, but the, coal, the, the, the post-war period was over. Japan and Germany were producing quality products, and the Koreans and the Taiwanese were beginning to get into heavy manufacturing. And so basically, we and these, all of our manufacturers had shared their monopoly rents with the unions, and we were just uncompetitive. Yeah. Well, the, the, and so uh, Reagan the, basically yeah. said to them, compete or die. Yeah. And what happened? They competed. The origins of uh, NAFTA. Seeds were planted at the end of the Reagan era of, of, of uh, 86, 87, 88. Actually, tax I introduced reform. the first NAFTA and in 1987. I think you did, in 1987. Yeah, in the first along NAFTA with, bill. with Jerry Lewis and Jim Colby. We and the whole the basis first bill for that was in, in, in tear down the border. Well, it was, the, it, yeah, the, the basis was very clearly. Right. I didn't believe that I, as a member of Congress, had a right to say to the American consumer that you can't have access to the best quality product at the lowest possible price without my imposing a penalty on you. A tariff is a tax. There needs to be recognition that it's a tax. And the other thing that Greenspan taught me a long time ago, and you, Professor, know this very well, is, is Greenspan says, more than half the equation on trade is imports. Raw materials coming into the United States, that, which creates the ability for us to manufacture here. And so, you know, the neo, you know, commercial, you know, view of trade is that the only benefit to trade is what we export. But yeah. imports are such an important part of the entire uh, component. The they're, they're, a part, they're a part of if remanufacturing. If we weren't wearing too. imported exactly. garments, this whole crowd would be naked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Everybody try to remove that visual from your thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know that. No, I we, know that. We know have that, another, you strengthen it, though. We have another question from Anthony Eames. Okay, uh, Anthony Eames of the Reagan Foundation and Institute. Uh, Congress, Pull the microphone's not on. Your mouth. Yeah. Here we go. Can you hear me yeah. now? Okay, um, Congressman Dobb, you mentioned the Social Security Reform Act. We haven't done anything on Social Security since. I want to pivot to another thing we haven't done anything on since Reagan, 1986 Immigration Act. That's true. Can you give us a little color 
to Reagan's work with Congress on that. I, uh, I introduced 19 amendments to the Rodino Did bill really? wow. uh, on the floor of the House uh, and, wow. and uh, had spent time as a lawyer in the immigration world and was one of the people basically, uh, I, and I voted against the bill on final passage, but many of my amendments were included in the bill. But just remember one thing, three million people who were undocumented in Reagan's bill and in the Rodino bill were given amnesty in that bill. So it was sort of the early debate. Reagan, Reagan really appreciated the, the ethnicity of America and the, the roots of American immigration. In these radio shows before he was governor, you could go back and look at some of the, the dialogue he had with people of all walks of life and different varieties of beliefs. And so that was a part of that bill. And he was very supportive of it. And uh, it was very contentious within the Republican uh, House to begin with, but it did pass. And I think it was an important uh, step and another uh, piece of his legacy that should be remembered as uh, very substantive and very, very uh, 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 courageous on his part. Yeah, the Thank, well, go, go ahead. ahead. Thanks for raising it, Anthony. And congratulations and thanks to you for everything that you've done to work to bring us together here. Um, it was a very tough bill, and at the end of the day, our, col our California colleague Dan Lundgren was one of the great right, leaders right. in championing this, and, and Ron Mazzoli, and, and anyway, the people were involved, and then the 19 amendments that, that, that Hal Dobb had. But the thing that struck me was, at the end of the day, I also voted no uh, on it at the end of the day. And the thing that I said is, is that I did not want employers to become Border Patrol agents. And that was basically what was included in that bill. Uh, when you looked at the issue of employer sanctions. And it wasn't the amnesty thing as much as that. Since that time, by the way, I mean, I, am, I believe in the free flow of goods, services, capital, information, ideas, and people. And I would argue that were it not for our North American Free Trade Agreement, all the problems that we have in the area of illegal immigration would be much, much worse than they are today. Because today, at this moment, I mean, it was supposedly trashed by the last president, but we know that it was basically done what we said in 1993. There was no internet when we did it. It was brought to the, to the forefront then, and we said we need to update this thing. So it's been updated, but there's a billion and a half dollars a day in cross-border trade between Mexico and the United States mm -hmm. that continues. And were it not for that, the problem that we have here would be much, much worse. Think um, about it very simply, immigration, Social Security, two of trade. How much courage have we seen in the White House by presidents of either party since then? Well, it's, it's, it's yeah. a great point. Huh? Let, well, me ask you, let, let me I, ask you. I, I want to say one thing about immigration. The problem with illegal immigration is it's illegal. Uh, we need legal immigration. There are a lot of talented people sure. in this world who want to come here, want to work, want to build the American dream. Part of, we are not the most brilliant people on earth. Uh, we just have the best economic system in the world and ordinary people like us do extraordinary things here. But where there are brilliant people who want to share in our freedom, I want them to come, but I want them to come legally. The problem with our immigration reform bill was not the amnesty. It's just that we never enforce the law. We have never done what we, we're the only major country in the world that does not control illegal immigration. Here, here. Um, let, let me ask you guys how you brought me on to thought. If you had to give the three of you, if you had to give a piece of advice to, let's say, we have 13 Republican candidates for the president right now. To give people advice, say, take something out of the Reagan portfolio, make it your own. Whether it's a piece of temperament, maybe it's about his temperament, which we talked a lot about. Maybe it's policy. I mean, free trade's a dirty word now on the campaign trail. You can't even say it, right, without getting arrested. Um, but it just seems that the candidates seem to perhaps, have, to my mind, have lost the bubble on understanding and finding their own voice on clear expressions of kind of classic Reagan policy, or even finding that optimistic temperament and being able to express these things. So if you could give them one, what, what should they take from the Reagan legacy and your experience working with him in Congress, if you could give a piece of advice to them? Well, to make wise and workable public policy, 
you have to be sure you listen to the facts and be sure you measure how the facts, if they're changed by the idea, affect the stakeholders. Reagan really impressed me as somebody who listened and didn't often go into a meeting with a contentious subject matter with his mind absolutely made up. He really did listen and wanted to take in the variety of ideas that were going to be affected by the potential decisions. So to make that wise and workable public policy, I think that leaders today need to listen more. And the better than half of the contenders in the Republican Party presidential race right now don't listen. So one of the things that, that President, and I, I would say to all of these candidates and those, I had dinner last night with Tim Scott, and I'm so impressed and blown away with him. He served on the rules committee that I chaired in his first term in 2010. So we talked about some of these things, and I, I told him I was coming here today. He sends his regards to all of you. It's just an amazing story, an amazing human being. And I see in him deeply rooted principles, which is the thing that Ronald Reagan had. I mean, that's, I, I mentioned it earlier, John. I mean, I'm not a great communicator. I'm just communicating great ideas. I mean, that was the way, the way Reagan put it. One of the most important things that he did was a speech that he delivered on June 8th, 1982 at Westminster in which he talked about fostering the infrastructure of democracy. It led to the establishment of the National Endowment for Democracy and uh, the institutions that are done. One of the things in 2005, sort of a grandchild of that, I mean, I, I established something called the House Democracy Partnership where we in 21 countries around the world were working to strengthen and build the parliaments, these new and re-emerging democracies. And they're still working today and I'm very proud of that. But in that speech, June 8th of 1983, 1982, Ronald, said, Ronald Reagan said, uh, self-delusion, self-delusion in the face of unpleasant facts is folly. Self-delusion in the face of unpleasant facts is folly. Those were the, and because of what we've gone through in the last seven years, when I read that speech again the other day, that line of Reagan's when he was addressing, he was at Westminster and Margaret Thatcher was right in the front row. And I, by the way, I commend to all of you, and I regularly do, go back and look at that speech. You can see it on YouTube, you can read it. I mean, it was so, so powerful. And uh, I think that, and to me, this, you know, this, his quest for what he described as American exceptionalism and American universalism is something that's really, really, really powerful. And, I, and, and, and frankly, I mean, I will say, I, I'm, not, I'm really not in politics since I got in the media business, as Roger mentioned. I'm really not that involved. I last supported Jeb Bush in 2016. Didn't but, you chair his campaign for president? Oh, yeah. Actually, Chuck Heston and I were the leaders of his campaign for president. You know, So Charlton Heston so wanted this guy to be president. I wish you'd done too. a better job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so he blames yeah. me. Yeah, he blames me. Well, John McCain well, was on there, too. Let me say about Reagan. <laughs> Reagan. Actually, people thank me for not doing a better job. Reagan <laughs> believed that the solution to our problem, problems was in expanding freedom and that government was not the answer. That freedom and the ability of free people to deal with problems was the basis of American prosperity and success. And um, uh, I believe that, and I believe the sooner we get back to it in terms of our national policy, yep. the better off we'll be. So learn from Reagan this, paid staff unlicensed is a danger to liberty. He was very careful to define his expectations from his principal staff and expected them to do the same with mm. their pieces of the pyramid, mm. making sure that people knew their role and that his vision or his idea for a policy change was well understood by everybody and well defined and then held people accountable. Got a right. question here. Right. Yes, I think, yep, well, Paul, and then let's try to get him Paul and Beth and maybe one more before we conclude. Thanks, John. Paul yep. Leto with the American Enterprise Institute. Um, can you talk about Reagan and the defense budget? Uh, and I'm particularly interested in um, Reagan and the Strategic Defense okay. Initiative. I know the White House was very concerned that they not lose public support for that initiative for their own reasons over the years. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk about Reagan and the defense budget and SDI specifically. Gorbachev understood it too. Yeah, but 
My I favorite mean, line came from my favorite line came from uh, his Texas colleague Charlie Wilson. And Charlie Wilson, Afghan I remember sitting with him, and, and uh, you know Charlie Wilson's war and all that, and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And so Charlie, Charlie Wilson said, you know, he said, I don't know whether it works, but as long as they believe it might work, that's good enough for me. That was his whole view on SDI. <laughs> yeah. what, 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 how did you guys view this? Because when you look at the ranking of Reagan's policy successes in Congress, and you know they tabulate the votes and all this stuff. SDI is pretty far down the list. It's not considered to be a successful yeah. issue that he worked with Congress. How did you view it when you were there? Mm -hmm. This is the, which issue? The Strategic the SDI, Defense Strategic Initiative. Strategic Defense Initiative, and, that and, SDI. Oh, yeah. no, Star Wars, Star he, he, Wars. He scored high on defense budgets in general, in general. But when you get down to issues, and especially Star Wars, it, Congress wasn't with them the whole way. It was, it was a tough journey. Well, I think everybody understood that it was a it was a visionary program that had profound effects in terms of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Russians didn't believe we could do it, but they weren't sure. And they knew if we could do it, it changed everything. So I think it did have an effect on our dealings with Gorbachev and with the Soviet Union. Well, there were four meetings um, in the third meeting. Gorbachev said when they thought they had the deal in the third meeting, I'll keep my word, but you have to give up SDI. Yeah, and that meeting broke up with no deal until the fourth meeting when they resolved that issue. Well, and I would have to say that the discussion about sharing it with the Soviet Union, that's yeah, we yeah, developed it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, never, I never took that seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's sharing and then there's sharing. Uh, Beth, please, could, if we could get a microphone. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Beth Fisher from the University of Toronto, and I have a question about the future rather than the past. You've described a president who was both principled and popular, and that got me to thinking that uh, everyone benefits when there is a Republican Party that is robust and that puts forward fact-based policies that are open to debate. Everyone benefits, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, American, foreigner, everyone benefits from a robust uh, Republican Party. How do we facilitate that? How do we enable that based on your uh, work with uh, the Reagan administration? Well, one thing you have to do is, is you have to capture the imagination you have to capture the imagination of the American people. As, as you said this, it reminded me of an experience I have. And, and because I was working on trade issues and I'd worked on the NAFTA because you know George Bush left in 1982 being defeated by Bill Clinton, I worked closely with Clinton in the 90s on the trade issue itself. You were on his and, national policy. Yeah, right? oh, that was Obama's. I went into Obama's, Obama's actually. Obama's, I went into right. Obama's, but, but I went into, I went, by the way, I did serve in the Obama administration when I left the Congress to do one thing to go on the Foreign Affairs Policy Board. You know why? I told him I didn't agree with most any of Obama's foreign policy, but it was to get the Trans-Pacific Partnership done, trade. Yeah, which trade. was one of the greatest mistakes that I believe was made, mm -hmm. and President Trump vitiated that on his opening day. But anyway, so, but in 1997, I went on this trip through Latin America with President Clinton. I was his token Republican on, on this trip. And, you know, and I was talking, and they, you know, the opposite of him. So Madeleine Albright and Bill Clinton got me in the corner at a meeting in Buenos Aires and said, David, you think like a Democrat, you talk like a Democrat, you act like a Democrat. Maybe some of you think I do. But anyway, and he said, you should be a Democrat. And my response was to Bill Clinton, I said, Mr. President, Probably the best thing that I can do to assist the Democratic Party is to create a vibrant, robust, strong Republican Party. And Madeleine Albright was really pushing me hard to make this change, and Clinton looked to me to his credit and he said, you're absolutely right. Keep working on doing that because this competition is so vitally important for us. And, you know, I, 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 I've always sort of reminisced about you know, Reagan, but kind of, you know, I would say 15 years ago, I got, hey, listen, we got to kind of get beyond this. In the last seven years, I've been, never been so troubled politically. And I literally thank God every day that I chose to leave the Congress exactly when I did, which was before we've gone through what we have over the last, you know, seven, eight years. And, uh, and, and I did that. And I, 
but I still feel, I mean, I, now I'm so much looking for a Ronald Reagan. I'm so, you know, committed to that. And I'm looking, I'm looking for that person who I can, again, vote for, um, which just hasn't been the case in either the, the, either the, either the House or Senate or, the, uh, or in the presidency, clearly. And so it's, it's, it's been a really difficult time for those of us who are passionate Reagan Republicans. And so that's why we need to capture it. And I mean, I just throw out Tim Scott's name, but because I, I, I like him a lot and I've worked with him. Well, we don't want you to leave California either. We need you to stay out here and fight. Well, that's, that's the other issue. So many of my friends, of course, I mean, you all know, have left the state. And I said they gave me the honor for a third of a century to represent him in Congress. And so I'm not planning to leave California. Okay, so so I, I'm looking at your question and I've been thinking about it. And it's a good one. And I don't want to sound like a pessimist now. But if you look at the current political landscape, you probably won't, you and I won't find that better voice in the White House from either party for another term or two or three because there's an evolution going on in my view relative to the way the Electoral College works, the way the uh, congressional uh, uh, votes stack up. It's about even, even now in both political parties. You, you can play a lot of scenarios with it. And there's not enough time between now and the delegate selection process by both parties this time around in Chicago and in Milwaukee for anyone to emerge to get the name ID and the money and the delegates to change the, the landscape, unfortunately, that we may see in front of us right now. On the other hand, Miracles never cease. And so to turn that, that crepe around just a little bit and say that the yearning you're talking about is beginning to be felt, at least I feel it, in the Midwest. I don't know about the yeah, coast, I, but I, it's, there's a turning that's going on right now. So what's going on right now may not be all that bad if you look at politics more decadally than just in uh, two and four and six year terms. Hal says he's a pessimist, but I, I always uh, like I'm to not, take the I'm three. An optimist. Well, you just said he was pessimist. No, I but said I don't want to be sound like Yeah, yeah, but you are. So at the base, <laughs> at the base of the back of Ronald Reagan's statue, those three great quotes: "America's best days are yet to come. Our proudest moments are yet to be. Our most glorious achievements are just ahead." And so I continue to try and grasp onto that just as well as I possibly well, can. I, I can. I just want to say I, I just don't believe that the politics of grievance uh, yep. is going to continue to sell in this country. This is yep. the America is remotely similar to the America that I grew up in. Uh, people are tired of Donald Trump. His, most of his problems he created. Uh, he has no filter between his brain and his mouth. Uh, and it's time for us to move on and find new leadership. And at some point here, somebody running for president is going to begin to talk about kitchen table issues. What people care about. Not this time around. And you know, the 2020 election is over with. We're not gonna go back and recontest it. Why the hell do we wanna keep talking about it? And I think in the end, people want a president that's focused on their future. And we, you know, I've, I've recommended to two of our candidates that they use a line like, I'm not focused on what my problems have been in the past. I'm focusing on fixing your problems in the future. It's not my grievance I want to talk about. It's your future I want yep. to talk about. I don't have and a I candidate think, yet. I think when somebody I'm grabs I don't, that, I don't have a candidate yet, that they're going to go, that. and if I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to say, I don't believe that Trump will be the nominee of the, Dem of the Republican Party, and I don't believe Biden will be the, the nominee yeah. of the Democrat Party. A lot of people say that. There's a, there's a Bob, now, we got a hell of a lot of <laughs> graves that have got to be dug, people have got to be buried. <laughs> to get there, but I think it's, uh, 
I really believe that's going to happen. To, I hope you're right. To be continued. Yeah, right. that, that's a real stretch. David, give us those three quotes again. Is America's it? best day to yet, are yet to come. Okay. Our proudest moments are yet to be. Our most glorious achievements are just ahead. Terrific stuff. So I, like a lot of you teaching, I, I now train you know, students for public service. And there's a lot of cynicism these days about public service. Um, if you look at the Gallup polls, trust in institutions, the Reagan Institute polls, it's, it's not cheerful news. Um, but I think you have to agree these, uh, these three men are inspirations. They're great servants of our republic. And uh, I think uh, they inspire me, and I think they should continue to inspire our country as well. So please join me in thanking our Thank three you. discussants today. Thank you. Thanks to you guys. Good great with you guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Just a few uh, quick announcements from me. Um, so we have our cocktail reception this evening over in the Ronald Reagan Pub in the.